Well, without further ado, I'm officially starting our event today on how to design your own on-farm research. For those who don't know me, my name is Rachel Rusin and I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisor Program. This is a regional agricultural extension program in the Kootenai Boundary region that is funded by three regional districts, the Regional District of Kootenai Boundary, Central Kootenai, East Kootenai and Columbia Basin Trust. Um, today I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Sinaiaks and Tanaha. Um, I'm physically based in Rosalind, but our team with the Farm Advisors is virtual in nature and situated um, in the East Kootenai and the West Kootenai. And today joining us, oh, Danny Smart, whose name is appearing as Rachel Rusin. So she officially is my doppelganger. <laughs> um, and she is joining us from Kimberly and she's supporting with the technology today. And I'm really excited to present this event today, which is more of a workshop style, welcoming people to join us today to actually discuss on-farm research ideas that they would like to do on their farm. And we have Dr. Catherine Tarasoff joining us today, who's going to help guide us through templates to design your on-farm research. And she has supported developing three templates about looking at on-farm research questions um, over the last two years. And I'm just quickly going to recap what Catherine and I have been working on for the last couple of years with producers. And, and there is a need in the province to do more applied on-farm research. This has been identified by producers. And in the last two years, Catherine and I worked with three different farms on three different research questions. These pictures here are a project we did in the East Kootenai with Tyler Morrison. We did a presentation with him last week and that recording is available on our website where he wanted to look at yield questions and seeding rates. So he was curious on trying new varieties and seeing what seeding rates he would get the most success with those seeding rates. And so we developed templates for Tyler to look at how to analyze success regarding yield for new varieties. Another project we did was in Rock Creek, and this was working with a rancher named Jamie Haynes. He also presented his project a couple of weeks ago, and we have a recording of his project as well. He was really curious to in increase his soil health, specifically his soil infiltration rates. He's a dryland rancher in the Rock Creek area, and he was curious if incorporating tillage radish into his farm production would increase the rate that water could enter the soil. So we called that our soil health project. We tried to see if incorporating tillage radish actually could improve soil health. The last project that we did was in Creston, and this was working with uh, farmer Don Lowe. He's in the top right there. And his question was, does mulching my orchard help increase my water efficiency and I guess potentially water conservation? So working with Don for two years, we looked at if mulching his orchard, we could actually increase the soil moisture in his blocks and also relate that to cherry quality as well. And so we developed a template working with Don on this research question. The end result from our two years of working with these producers on their research questions is we developed templates based on their questions so that any producer could use those templates to sort of, I wouldn't say replicate their research design, but it's, it's, it's a guiding document to help producers work through questions of soil health, mulching to reduce water use, or looking at trying new varieties. And so today, this is sort of the complimentary roundup workshop to say, are there any last minute questions or any ideas that have percolated from you through thinking about doing your own on-farm research? And I want to mention that we received funding to do these on-farm research projects with the Farm Adaptation Innovator Program, and that's a project of the Climate and Agriculture Initiative in BC. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the reins over to Catherine. Oh. And Catherine, do you want to facilitate the roundtable introduction so we know who's in the room today? Sure. Um, I don't see the participants on my screen. Okay. You know what? I, I can I can do it because I can see them. I have the Brady Bunch screen more. So okay. um, <laughs> we do want to know who's joining us today, just because we're we're tailoring this workshop to the questions that people have in the audience. So I'll call your name out. Please introduce yourself. Say where you're joining from and where you're at with research design, or if, or if you're just 
tuning in to just find out what this is all about, that's absolutely fine as well. We have a guinea pig in the audience today. His name's Mike Malmberg, and we're going to be setting him up to just design his own on-farm research. So Jennifer, can I start with you? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Jen and I'm located in Smithers, BC. Um, and I split my time between the islands and here. Um, I'm here just for a little bit of inspiration. I'm actually a grad student and I'm looking at um, a small scale farming research. Um, and I'm also a biologist. So I'm kind of trying to combine the two into my grad research. Um, I have interests in um, like rotational grazing, using livestock um, to improve soil health and invasive species control and, and things like that. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Sounds great, thank you so much. And Tanya with the KLA. Okay, hi, good morning everybody. Um, I wasn't expecting to be on camera, uh, kind of like Harmony, I was gonna say, I had to run and brush my hair. Um, note to sell yeah you look great anyhow okay and you don't have to turn your camera on for the other folks in the room too. i think i'm actually blushing now <laughs> anyway ah uh, let's reset and start my name's tanya i am representing the kootenai livestock association and um my my interest here today is uh to learn about the process of the the grab and go um templates the research uh templates um, my interest, albeit personal as well, is also just to get a better understanding of the process. And um, we have a membership of folks that are in the agricultural industry. And so I just want to make sure that um, I'm, I'm informed so that I can try and uh, share this information and encourage more folks to take advantage of this program. Thank you, Tanya. And thanks for being a collaborator as well. I think the recording of this event will be able to use also as a resource for folks who have questions, we can forward this on and so like a, a way to get started. Um, Patricia, I know you can't turn your camera on because you have low bandwidth out in the sticks. Yeah, I probably wouldn't turn it on anyways because I just rushed into the house with my head full of hay and didn't comb my hair yet today, so. Uh, yeah, I'm a certified organic grass finished small cattle producer, and I'm interested in the on farm research. I'm interested in the soil infiltration. Um, I'm using restorative agriculture practices and rotational grazing. So um, I'd like to see how that's improving my land over time. So I should start something as soon as possible so I can see the difference five years down the road. I haven't really decided how to go about all this yet. So hopefully today, as we go over the template, I can firm up some of my ideas and that would be great. That's it, <laughs> thanks. Great, thanks, Patricia. And um, I'm glad you could join us. And I think what we'll review with Mike and his project idea will be relevant to maybe get started on your thought process and research design. And Annalise. Um, oh, she may have stepped away for a second. Um, Harmony? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Jan Harmony Bjarnes and I work with the Climate and Agriculture Initiative um, and I'm um, yeah, kind of, uh, I am, I do have a farm, but I'm actually here more on a professional note today with the Climate and Agriculture Initiative's work um, and just thinking about the types of research or hearing about the types of research that producers are interested in conducting on their farms. We at the Climate and Agriculture Initiative um, do a lot of projects to support agricultural adaptation um, in the agricultural field. So it's always kind of, you know, we know that we need to test new varieties and um, use water in different ways or conserve water in different ways and so on. So it's just really helpful for me to kind of hear a little bit about where people's heads are at um, when we talk about on-farm research and, and the tools that producers need to carry out research on their own farms. That's something that comes up, not just in the Kootenays, but all over the province. So I think um, it is certainly an area 
um, with the resources that we've developed an area that there's a lot of potential for in the future, both at the farm level and then also to, you know, potentially have a coordinating body, um, you know, working with a group of different farmers to do similar trials on their own farms and things like that. So I think there's, yeah, I'm just kind of here to listen about um, what people are thinking about. So thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Harmony. And so without, I think Annalise must have stepped away for a second. If she wants to introduce herself later, that's great. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Catherine Tarasov, who's been working very closely with us for the last couple of years to develop these grab and go research templates. So thank you, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, so I'm going to start with going through um, a PowerPoint. Um, some of you, I mean, I've met some of you, some of, of course, are new to me, um, but I've been doing on-farm research in the province now, I guess, for about seven or eight years. And so the first set of pro projects was actually up in the Vanderhoof area, and it is part of a much larger manual called the Guide to On-Farm Demonstration Research, which I will be kind of referencing as we go along. And then from that manual, um, the next, well, we had a few projects in between that were more educational. I work with the Sustainable Ranching Program at TRU, and um, <clears throat> we developed a um, curriculum for their students. And then um, the manual then sort of um, inspired these templates, which are really just the boiled down version of the manual, the key information from the manual, um, but with um, some much uh, sort of um, um, more focused guidelines within it and trying to take some of the guesswork out of it for producers because sometimes getting started is the hardest part. Um, coming up with an idea can be the hardest part. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, we're going to go through a PowerPoint and Mike Momberg is online and um, as we go through kind of the PowerPoint and his project, I'm also going to ask people if they have questions or if that's something they're interested in and just get a feel, you know, we want it to be a real open um, session and, and for there to be engagement if you're at a point where you feel like you're ready to, to ask some questions or, or put your own farm experience kind of like out there and we can talk through it. Um, so I'll take over the reins here. Where do I do that? <clears throat> You're a co-host, so you should, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to just press screen share. Okay. Oh, shoot. Where is it? <clears throat> just looking for my, hmm, hold on a second. Oh, there we go. <coughs> okay. And, and just so everyone knows, Catherine's uh, also just getting over the COVID. So yes, if she has a coughing fit, we excuse her from the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I sort of, be start coughing violently, you'll know why. Um, I had the cough was gone and then it came back. Um, so this presentation really starts with introducing you to the concept of what producer led on farm research is. And um, I'm just gonna move this little down. So it's, it's really site and management specific research that addresses a particular question or need that you have. Um, <clears throat> it's very specific to your farm, your farming goals, the history of your farm, your management practices. Um, each each on-farm research project is literally a story. And so no two stories are the same. And what you see somebody else doing um, or if, if you're doing something and somebody says, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. It, that doesn't, it doesn't matter because somebody else might have tried something and it didn't work on their farm, but their farm is different from your farm. Um, it's not meant to be published or undergo any scientific 
sort of rigorous review, but you do have to follow a specific set of design criteria. And this is so that you have confidence in your results. Um, it's not super onerous. It's not, you know, a crazy level of detail, but it is just like almost like a checks and balances so that when it comes time to talk about your results, you're really confident. <clears throat> um, one of the key things that I like people to know about on-farm research is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to like blow the doors off of whatever production you're operating within. You actually want to um, build on what you know already works and you just want to build close to home. So um, sometimes when we start looking at ideas or we're thinking and we go online and we start searching around for other uh, projects or similar projects, it can lead you all over the place and you can end up down in Georgia or Florida or over in Ontario. And um, that's the results that they get on the Eastern half of the country is gonna be really different than the results that you could expect um, in BC. So it's important that you stick with close to home and that you build on what has already been documented to work. <coughs> um, sorry, I was just making sure that wasn't a, for me. So like Rachel said, we have these three templates and each template has a case study um, sort of built into the template that you can read and see what those different producers did. Um, you may decide to mimic exactly what the producer did or modify it, um, but there's enough, the templates are generic enough and what the producers did is sort of loose enough that you can modify it significantly. Like you don't have to be a cherry producer to test mulches. You can be any kind of a producer and mulches um, will help you. Same thing, you don't have to be a forage producer to test a new forage crop. You can test any kind of new crops um, following this template. <clears throat> So these are the eight basic steps that are in the templates. Um, I'm not gonna scroll through the template page by page. Instead, we're just gonna talk conceptually about what sort of is under each one of these eight steps. <clears throat> so the getting started step is really important. When I work with a producer, I spend a lot of time trying to understand what the end game is for that producer. And it, sometimes it takes a lot of back and forth because sometimes people wanna jump right to the research and it's important to back up and um, really, really think deeply about your farming goals. Um, what do you hope to achieve in, on the farm in 10 to 30 years? Um, and so those are conversations that you really need to have with yourself and to think deeply about where do I want to go? What are my, what are my challenges on the farm? Like, where do I struggle? And what, what's the, what are the key parts of this operation that seem to be either holding me back or presenting significant challenges year after year after year? <clears throat> so this is an example of a worksheet that does come out of the the guide to on-farm demonstration research. Um, you can find that um, at the link down there below. Basically, it's on um, my webpage, agrowest.ca. And these are also um, available through Farm West. If you um, visit the Farm West website, it's downloadable, it's free, um, and you can use the guide if you wanna kind of dive into more details but this is a worksheet that's in that guide. And it's really important <clears throat> that you take the time to think about your farming goals um, because the research that you do has to tie back to your goals. The next um, part of, um, 
of sort of your your deep thinking that you need to do is um, is assessing your resources. And um, I'm going to go through Mike. Mike and I. Um, I'm going to go through this little um, part with him. And so it's Mike. Is your is your um, are you unmuted? <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, there we yeah. are. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. Okay. So, um, so when we talk about farming goals, um, first we have to know a little bit, you know, just as the audience about um, Mike and his farm. So, can you tell us a bit about your farm and what you produce? Sure, Catherine. Thanks. I, and first of all, I, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, I did get my hair combed before I tried <laughs> to come on, but then I, I discovered I, I couldn't find my link up uh, information. And by the time I got to it, I pretty near pulled all my hair out. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad I made it uh, finally. Yes, my, um, I, I produce, uh, I graze yearlings on uh, irrigated alfalfa grass and um, uh, on a very intensive rotational grazing system. So that's basically the, what, I'm, what I'm farming about these days. <laughs> and, um, and so your goal for your farm? Yeah, my, my goal is to uh, see if I can increase the stocking rates. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for three years now and uh, I've achieved some fairly high stocking rates, and I'm wondering if it's possible to increase them a bit more. Great. Um, so now the next part is in order to get to your actual research question. So we've got a goal for the farm. It's to increase stocking rates. Now, goals are really pie in the sky, right? We're not even talking about how Mike's going to, how is he going to do that yet? All we know is that's what he wants. For you, it could be, I want to be a full-time farmer. Um, you know, I want to increase the, the um, productivity on, on the land that I have, or I want to, I, I really want to get into organic production. It can be anything at this point. Um, so the next part is to define an objective. An objective needs to be, it needs to be simple, it needs to be measurable. It needs to be complete. You can do it within a time frame. So, um, so your objective. So, how will you increase your stocking rates? What do you need to do? Great, thanks, Catherine. Well, I I, I figure the main thing for me to do to increase stocking rates is to be able to increase my productivity of my forage crop. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, that's the, that's my real focus. Great. So now we're starting to get, you know, like we're narrowing in here. So Mike needs to increase his yields on his, his um, <coughs> his little grazing system that he has. And, um, now we get to the research question. So how are you going to increase your yields? Well, I think that um, I'm at a stage now where uh, my irrigation system is working well and my rotational grazing system seems to be uh, working well, but I, I think if I can increase those yields um, and what I'd like to try to increase the yields is, uh, is uh, with, with adjusting fertilizer rates. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so we've gone from um, increasing stocking rates by increasing yields, and we're going to test fertilizer. Now, I, as a producer, you have to have a very serious conversation with yourself about the resources you have to put towards um, on-farm research. And um, so we're going to quickly go through this uh, other worksheet. Um, Mike. How much land do you have? Well, I, uh, I, I graze a total of five acres on my place, five irrigated acres of alfalfa grass. And I, how much I, of, of that land can you risk? Okay, yeah, and the, I, I, 
I do have additional land that's not irrigated, but the land that I can, the land that I can risk is, uh, um, well, I, I'll, I'll, I intend to use a small area in my five acre uh, grazing area where I can um, introduce an uh, fertility practice and I so it's going to be a pretty small area it'll be a strip across the fields uh, a certain width of of, uh, of land and across the field it'll probably be uh, less than a quarter of an acre in total in size. Great um, so we know that that field is your five acre field um, now are there any places on that five acre field that we need to avoid? Yeah, there are, Catherine. Uh, I, have a, I have a row of trees on the south end of my place. Well, it's not a row of trees, it's a clump of trees, and they're, they're big fir and yellow pine trees, and they cast a huge shadow, um, plus, of course, being big trees, and they've been there a long time, they have an extensive root system, so I, I want to make sure to avoid that area. There, those trees are also kind of in a depression, which is different than the rest of my fields. My field is very gently sloped and um, a little bit rolling, but not severe at all. But this area where the trees are has kind of a depression as well. Okay. And I'm, uh, my soils are fairly uniform with the exception of in that area. So. I am thinking I need to avoid that or I'll have some, um, some I'll be compounding my, <laughs> my, my ability to find out what responses I can get. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see Mike's, um, we'll see Mike's property here in a little bit and you'll see what he's talking about. Um, the next one is labor and this is important. Um, depending on how, you know, this may or may not be an issue for people, but depending on how big of a project you're doing, you do have to think about if you're gonna need to hire help and if your project is gonna come at a crunch time, you know, like you're trying to do this project right at the same time as like calving is happening or, you know, some other really, really critical period. So Mike, is your project conflicting with anything else that's going on? Um, no, Catherine, and that's one of the reasons I'm excited about doing this. It's something that I would have liked to have done uh, a long time ago, but I've been I've been busy with contract work and with working for government and uh, and uh, doing my own farming. And uh, so now that I'm retired, I've uh, dropped. I've uh, I'm not renewing my contract with the government this year so I'm going to have a bit of time and I think that I'm going to need about uh, uh, about uh, three or four days uh, to do the sampling the application will be uh, a day but uh, so I'll, I'll be able to do have time to do those when it's appropriate to to do the sampling and to do the applications great um now the next one is equipment. And I know Mike's equipment isn't super high tech, um, but <clears throat> we do need to know if your equipment is in good repair and if you need to borrow it from anybody and get things lined up ahead of time. Yeah, uh, well, my application procedure, I'm just going to use, uh, um, I, I, I do have a tractor um, fertilizer applicator, but I'm, I'm just going to use a, um, a handheld um, uh, rotary um, flail uh, applicator. So it's a, it's a bag that uh, I think you've probably all seen them. It's a, it's a bag that you strap on your shoulders and you, you put fertilizer in the bag and you turn the crank. This is, of course, after you've calibrated that uh, equipment so you know what levels uh, you're putting out but it's a pretty simple piece of equipment and it's uh, fairly new and it's used regularly around our place so yeah it's in work good working condition the other thing i am going to have to figure out though is uh, i have some clipping equipment that i've used to clip 
plots on in the past. And I think that that'll be fine, but I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to um, get a hold of some kind of, a, I've got a meter square and a meter quarter. They're made out of rebar, but uh, I do need some, uh, I could really, I'm going to have to think about something that I can use to, uh, to clip the, the plots to measure yields. Mm -hmm. Good. I use one of those little hand rice knives myself, um, like a little sickle, hand sickle. Um, yeah. So, and then the last thing that everybody needs to think about before you start on farm research is money and money management. So um, conducting on-farm research can cost very little or it can be pretty expensive depending on how, um, how far you go with it. Um, and if you need to hire someone to help you, like a farmhand. So Mike, um, do you have the money to buy the fertilizer that you need and, um, and uh, you know, set the time aside? Yeah, I sure do. Um, you know, the cost of the fertilizer is going to be uh, pretty small, maybe ten dollars, um, somewhere in that vicinity, and um, um, and the time I can I can set aside to do that. Um, uh, the the clipping and drying the, the the bags and those kinds of things are just going to be small change. Right. Good. So. Mike's gone through this process of um, really critically thinking about what he what he needs to have, uh, how much land he can risk. Sometimes um, people think they have to set aside a whole, you know, 40 acre field to do on farm research, but you really don't have to. You can um, go from as small as, you know, a couple of a couple of passes with um, uh, uh, fertilizer on on a, on the side of the field, right through to taking a sixty acre field and chopping it in half, um, and then of course it's really important to think about if you need equipment um, to make sure that it's calibrated and working. Because I have had producers that went to go seed fields and you know the engine blew on their tractor, or um, they found out that the um, the cedar was clogging up and um, needed to be kind of serviced. Okay, so the next one is, um, is to think about what you're going to test. So we already know that Mike wants to look at fertilizer, but there's a critical part about looking at fertilizer and that's, or anything, and, and that's why do you want to do it? Um, what's your justification for thinking that it will work? So it's, it's um, this is part of the going online and snooping around. Sometimes it's purely observational. Like I, I've seen somebody else doing it or, or people say that it works and I've seen it working on other people's farms. Other times it's, um, I've read some, I've read some um, research bulletins online and it's worked in other areas similar to my farm. And so that's why I think it'll work here. So, um, so Mike, um, why do you think the fertilizer is going to work? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that, that, that's a great question. And it's a, it's a question that's kind of plagued me for quite a number of years. Um, the, as I mentioned, I'm using alfalfa grass, irrigated alfalfa grass stands. And the sort of the conventional recommendations are if you have more than 50% alfalfa in the stand, which I do, uh, that uh, uh, particularly nitrogen fertilizer is not appropriate on those kinds of stands because you have a high level of legume in the stand and that legume is fixing nitrogen. So you shouldn't use, you shouldn't use or, and you shouldn't need nitrogen fertilizer. Now, that uh, although that's the conventional wisdom, um, I was involved in a in a fairly sophisticated fertilizer trial in the East Kootenays about well in the mid to late 1980s, and um, the purpose of this uh, fertilizer trial was to look at the the main nutrients NPK, sulfur, and boron, and to 
and to look at uh, various levels of all three of those nutrients while holding one of the nutrients steady. And uh, it, so it was a calibration trial to see if they could calibrate the response to fertilizer applications to yield. And the interesting thing that really shocked me was that um, we found that the optimum economic level of nitrogen application on those, on those plots was 168, and I remember that figure so vividly, 168 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So I think we were shocked by it. The scientist that was working with us was from the, uh, the soil branch of the Ministry of Agriculture in BC, who we used to have a soil branch, a very large one staffed with a number of soil scientists. And uh, he wasn't surprised about that because he told me that they had done similar trials in the North Okanagan and throughout the center of Okanagan in the previous number of years. And he said that that was not an uncommon finding. So I was very surprised and I, I spent a great deal of time talking to farmers in the area to see what they were doing in terms of fertilizer applications on alfalfa grass stands and, um, and found that most of them were using nitrogen, but only at very low levels, like about 30 pounds per acre. Whereas this test uh, trial, this experiment that we did said that you, if you wanted to uh, optimize your, your returns, you should be using uh, economically optimize your tune, your, your, you should be using, uh, you know, up to the, re, the trial set up to 168 pounds per acre. So I, I've, uh, I've always had that issue in the back of my mind. I know that um, uh, apparently uh, nitrogen fixation doesn't really start to occur until soils warm up and the nitrogen fixing bacteria have a chance to start to grow and to start to form their nodules for the season. And they, in, in climates like ours, aren't usually starting to produce much nitrogen until late June at the earliest. So you have a, and, and our soils are depleted of plant available nitrogen in the early spring. That's our lowest level of nitrogen and they're usually very, very, very low levels. So we have plant growth starting to occur in mid-April and uh, go on through uh, May and on through uh, mid-June when they're really, um, they're really um, short of plant available nitrogen. So it seems there may be a, a logical reason. The other thing that often happens is, and may have been a factor when the trials were done in the 1980s is that uh, at that time, most producers had to apply inoculants to their alfalfa seed by hand. And nowadays, most inoculants, most seed is already inoculated with uh, the rhizobium inoculant. So maybe, maybe the reason for the uh, success in those days was that the nitrogen, that the alfalfa wasn't really fixing bacteria. And maybe it's or fixing nitrogen. And, and it's maybe more reasonable that that's happening now because of the changing uh, methods of production. Although- hey, Mike, It's yeah. amazing because you've done an exceptional amount of background thought into this. And it's like, all right, let's execute these <laughs> thought processes. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah I get it. So, Catherine, yeah, do you have the map or? Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll put the map up in a sec. Um, so the, the, when we think about what to test and why, so um, Mike has a lot, a lot of observations and a lot of experience to justify why he thinks this will work. All of those things that he talked about, we won't answer all of them with one research project. So that's another thing to keep in mind too, is when you do a research project, you want to keep it really simple. And you may answer, you know, you'll answer one question and then that might turn on a whole bunch more questions 
um, after that results. So let's bring up um, Mike's, oops. So here's Mike's field here. Like here's, a, here's the farm um, and here's the section that he's managing. Now here's the clump of trees that he was talking about at the end of the field. Um, and what he does is uh, there's a fence that runs down the middle. And so starting the middle of May, he just strip grazes the cows up this field. And then when he gets to the end around June 1st, turns around and he strip grazes them down here. And then the cows go somewhere else and they come back in the fall and it might be the middle of September, it just depends. And they do it all again. So there's um, two grazes that happen, two strip grazes that happen per side it during the growing season. Mike's field is pretty uniform, so that's really handy. So that shows you what we're talking about. Now, you may not have a field that's super uniform like that. Uh, you might have a lot of rolling, hilly terrain, and you wanna make sure that if you do have rolling, hilly terrain, that you lay your plots out so that both plots are running down the slope not stacked on top of each other like this, like if this was fertilized versus unfertilized, um, because this is dry and this is moist. And so you now have a, a moisture difference between your two plots that may, may have a bigger impact in your results than the fertilizer itself. When you go down the slope like this, then both sides have equal exposure to, to high dry, low moist, high dry, low moist. Um, in the um, template, so these both come from a template, you can see um, things to think about, like if you're gonna set your, um, your plots up to run the length of a field, you wanna make sure you have enough distance at the bottom and the top for you to get your equipment turned around and back up to speed. You want to make sure that you have gaps here so that you can get around your equipment from gate to gate without having to drive through your fields. So those are kind of like, just make sure you don't stick this right up against a fence line um, with no opportunity to get from a gate to a gate. Um, in this example, it's like Mike's, there's trees along the forest edge there. And so you want to put your plot at least one tree length away from here, if you can. Definitely as far away from the trees as you can get. And then in this example, there's this, this sort of like pond that sits in the middle or off to the side of the field. So the whole um, experiment's been placed so that it avoids this wet area. It avoids the influence of the trees you can still get your equipment up to speed, you've got room, and then you can also get your equipment around to get from gate to gate. Then we also have these corner posts so that you know where one treatment ends and the next one begins. It's really obvious when you're out there seeding, let's say, um, and it's just bare soil, it's obvious, but once everything grows up and is full size, it can be difficult to see where where one treatment stops and the next one starts. Okay, so you've done your getting started. You've had the conversation with yourself. You know, what are your goals? Um, what are you gonna test? That's sort of your research question. Where are you gonna put it? You wanna put it on either your, the, um, the field that is the flattest but if, it, if you're in rolling terrain, then you wanna make sure that you put your plots side by side. When you lay out your test plots, you wanna think about all those things we just uh, talked about on the previous slide. Now, so here's where we get into what Mike's actually gonna do. Um, so here's the two halves of his field and here's the strip of fertilizer that's gonna run down the middle of both halves. Recall that he grazes this 
side in May and it grazes this side in June. So we're actually, you know, fundamentally we're talking two fields, two separate fields because they have completely, uh, you know, they're managed different. I mean, they're not managed differently, but the timing of the grazing is different. And Catherine, so he'll take it. Can I just Pardon? interject too, just something that mm -hmm. Mike and I have talked a lot about and, and just something when part of that pl planning process and it, it's demonstrated really well with your picture here is that there always has to be that control, which is the non-treated area. And I find that sometimes when Mike and I talk to producers about on-farm research, there's a great willingness to try something, but we need the comparison for the thing you try versus the thing that you didn't do anything to. Yeah. So you can't just, like in Mike's situation, he's not just trying fertilizer and therefore applying it to the entire five acres. No, it's like we're trying this on a portion and then there's the control. So right. it's the A versus B. And I just wanted to reiterate that because Mike and I often encounter producers who are so enthusiastic and they're like, yes, I have 10 acres. I'm going to try riots and peas, but without thinking about what they're comparing it to. Mm -hmm. So sorry to interject yeah. there. And I no, think that this great. demonstration here really outlines how you're only trying part of the field on that. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times we say control but we could also say just, you know, um, our conventional practice or our normal practice. So that, you know, like with Jamie, he had his standard annual forage that he planted. And so that's his standard practice, his conventional forage. And then his treatment was just to add the tillage radish in to that standard practice. And so, yeah, control can be either you know, kind of, we often think of it as doing nothing, but really it's what's your standard practice. And now you want to compare your new possibility against your standard possible, you know, your standard operational procedures. So yeah, so Mike has his standard alfalfa stand, unirrigated or unfertilized, just, you know, ticking along. And then we're going to put the strip of fertilizer down each half of the field. So yeah, good point. Um, okay, so we also know that um, once he applies his fertilizer down the middle, here, I'll go back actually, you just leave it, right? Like, don't tinker with it. Don't decide that, oh, I think I'm going to put a little more fertilizer, you know, up here. It's just not looking so great to me right now. Don't, don't play around with it, just leave it. And it'll all become apparent as, as the season progresses. <clears throat> now, Mike uses this half in May, this half in June. So we have to sample it um, right before he puts the cows in. So what I always um, tell people is that you need 10 measurements per treatment. And so these little circles, they um, are indicating Mike's hula hoop that he's going to throw out there when he goes out. And so you can see that his hula hoop on this side. So all his cows are sitting here, right? It's May 14th. They're all ready to get in there. And um, he's applied his fertilizer in the spring. So before his cows go in and start eating his results, Mike has to go ahead of them and throw 10 hula hoops in his fertilized section and 10 hula hoops in his unfertilized section. And he's gonna avoid this because here's where his trees are and his trees are gonna make really weird results, right? They're shady, they suck up all the water, the growing season's all weird. So you, you make it intentional, I'm avoiding those trees he can still fertilize down here. That's no big deal, right? That's probably easier, just straight line of fertilizer. But when it comes time to sample, you want to avoid those really big anomalies on your field. So here's his 10. He goes out May 14th. 
He does his 10 hula hoops here. He lets the cows in, then they strip graze. That's great. Oh, they're at the end. It's June 1st. I know that I got to bring them around for this field. Well, while they're on their last little strip, then Mike has to go over to this field and he has to do the same thing. 10 in the fertilized, 10 in the unfertilized. We know that the cows are gonna work their way along here and it's gonna take two weeks. So the yields that he gets will be indicative of those sort of that, that sort of two weeks worth of growth. Like he's, he's out there a little bit ahead of them, but the alfalfa is not gonna grow so fast that he has to take samples every time he moves the fence. That would be way too much work. So there needs to be a bit of a modification that, yep, they're gonna be in there for two weeks, and the yields that I take at the beginning are reflective of what they're going to get for that two weeks while they're in there moving along. And then he goes over here and he does it again. <clears throat> and now remember, they're going to come back again in the fall. So you're going to repeat this whole thing again in the fall so that you can get a true yield difference between the fertilized and the unfertilized. You might find that in the fall, there's no difference. The spring, there was a big difference. The fall, there's no difference. The nitrogen's all gone. That's okay. But if you don't take those measurements, you'll never know. So there's actually four sets of measurements. There's, there's May 15th, June 1st, fall one, fall two. And I had a question for Mike. Mike, are you going to be, um, oh, it's probably getting there now. Yeah, I was asking Mike, because this seems to be the part that really catches producers sometimes is like the met the, the weighing or the measurement of those hoops and I can see you're getting into that now so I'll let you keep talking sorry to interject yeah that's okay so um yeah so this this is just a photo of what the a hoop looks like on the ground and um to take 10 samples so like um when we did the forage analysis and we did 10 per treatment 10 hoops per treatment in a different project. It only takes about maybe two hours to, to throw the hoop, to walk, to cut it, to bag it. And then we just put the bags like uh, on an ATV, took them all back and weighed them inside the house where there was no wind and it was comfortable. Um, so it's not a super onerous um, uh, task. The, um, the key is just that you do 10, because if all you do is run your baler down the middle of that swath and say, well, I'll just count how many bales I get. Well, your baler is inaccurate, right? An 800 pound baler doesn't produce 800 pound bales. Um, <clears throat> you won't get any idea around the variability across the field like, oh, the top end, I got great yields, but the bottom end, the fertilizer didn't make any difference. What's going on there? I'm not gonna waste fertilizer on the bottom of my field. I'm only gonna apply it to the top because it just didn't do anything for the bottom half of my field. Well, if you just baled the whole field and counted the number of bales, you would never know the, the, the nuances of the field. So it's really important to take those hoops, to throw those hoops, and to see actually what's going on um, with the variability across your field. And it gives you a much greater level of accuracy. Um, don't count bales on a field. <laughs> That's my bottom line. Do the hoops. <clears throat> so whether it's 10 hoops per treatment in a forage study, or whether it's down here, we're doing 10 soil moisture measurements across a field, across two fields, or like for um, the, um, the mulching, we did 10 soil moisture measurements under the mulch versus not under a mulch. Um, on Jamie's project, we did 10 water infiltration measurements in the forage radish seeded part versus no forage radishes. So, um, or if you're in a row crop, if you're a row cropper, then instead of doing hoops, you do one meter, like a, a one meter stick, and you lay that down on the, on the row and you dig up all your carrots or you dig up all your whatever fennel 
that is growing on that one along that one meter section. And then you do that 10 times inside your treatment, outside on your conventional practice. If you're dealing with bushes like blueberries or even strawberries, where you're actually harvesting individual plants, uh, grapes, if you're doing uh, in, a, in a winery vineyard, then you would do 10 individual plants. So you'd take the yield from 10 individual plants in your treatment, out your treatment. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? <coughs> um, I was wondering if Mike is, is he weighing these samples? Mm -hmm. And if so, I'm just, just to break it down even more. So Mike would like set a measurement, say I'm gonna harvest everything an inch above the soil. So you kind of stick with that same amount. And then would he put, he would cut everything within that hoop and put it say in a paper bag and then weigh that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and actually it's best to harvest at whatever height your equipment would harvest at. So if your swather comes through at five inches, then that's actually the height you want to harvest at because okay. that's more, uh, you know, true to life. Sometimes people want to harvest right to the ground, like they're, they're harvesting like a centimeter off the ground because they want everything in the bag. But that's not really, you're, not, you're never going to harvest that low. So whatever your swather comes through at or whatever height, you know, if you're going to graze this, um, then you need to think about, okay, how do animals use this when they're grazing? I'm going to try to replicate a little bit, you know, an animal's behavior, but not to the point of being tedious. Um, and then it goes in the bag. Um, now, and then on the bag, you would label like hoop one fertilizer, you know, maybe you call it field A, May 5th, May 14th, then that's, that's one bag. And then you go throw the hoop, you go to the next one, hoop two fertilized May 14th. Um, sometimes people get worried about this wet weight, dry weight, but um, for Mike's field, because the whole thing is the same crop, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to dry it down and worry about wet weight, dry weight. That's only when you're looking at two totally different crops, like you're, you know, you, you've got alfalfa on one half of the field and grass on the other half, and you're trying to, you know, um, for most people, you're dealing with a uniform um, field that's all kind of the same thing. And so drying it down, it's not worth the effort, I don't think. Yeah. Um, but this does bring me to another one. A lot of people want to do work with animals. And so if you're working with animals and you want to try, say, giving them a different feed ration or a different you know, feed mix or timing of feeding or anything like that, then you just have 10 animals that got the feed ration and you weigh them, you know, along every, however many, you know, once a week or whatever you do to look at their weight gain. And then you have your 10 animals that didn't get the feed ration, or maybe you have 80 animals that didn't get the feed ration, but you pick 10 and they become the animals that you weigh every week. So you have 10 that are identified, they're getting a unique feed ration, 10 that are identified that are not getting the feed ration and you just follow their weight gain through the growing season. And, um, and then that becomes a way to, to monitor animals if you wanna look at something like weight gain with a different feed ration. So it's always about 10. <coughs> now, this one is for uh, row croppers, but it also is for, um, for forage folks too, there's, you know, it's not all about yield. <coughs> so this example shows that if you do something like carrots, you still have to separate out your marketable from your cold crop. And that can be anything, you know, from carrots in this example, carrots that are too small, carrots that have disease or blemishes, anything that makes them not marketable. And then you can start to see that, oh yeah, the overall yield was greater, but my proportion of culled vegetables was also greater. 
So now actually it's not benefiting me because I'm throwing out more carrots than I used to. Um, ideally, you'd want to have better yields and better marketability, but that's just something to keep in mind that, um, that it's not always all about yield, especially when you're looking at um, a crop like, you know, a marketable crop like carrots. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is in um, forage systems, we often separate the, out the weeds from the forage so that again, you can have a, a great yield, but, or, or yeah, so you have a great yield, but you've increased your proportion of weeds, then that becomes important because um, forage, the value of forage goes down as the proportion of weeds goes up. Um, so those are just things to think about when you're thinking about uh, yields that, um, it is good to separate out your yields so you get a true idea of the value of the crop. Okay, <clears throat> so <coughs> this is just a little example of a field data sheet that you would take out with you or that you would use to record your data when you're out there. So for example, with Mike, this isn't his exact example. This just came out of the research manual but um, he sampled it. This would be May 14th. He was out there May 14th. He used a hula hoop, or you can use a one meter squared quadrat. It's alfalfa. It's the first time. It's the first uh, cut here. Now we have our 10 hoops. Here was the weight of the 10 hoops individually in the fertilized areas. And here's the weight of the 10 hoops individually in the control. And you can simply just take an average yield. This is all in grams. You could just simply take an average yield and then you can scale that up to um, tons per acre just based on um, grams per meter squared. <coughs> so the template is really to help you avoid common mistakes and pitfalls that are easy to, um, to, to do. They're easy mistakes. They're easy things that at the end of your research, you would look back and say, oh, nuts. I wish I hadn't put the one plot on top of the hill and the other plot on the bottom of the hill. Gee, you know, I was, I was walking in dust at the top and my boots were getting muddy on the bottom. That's a, something I wish I hadn't done. Um, you'll still have to do all the work. There's no way around that, but your work will be much more useful to you um, when you avoid these common mistakes. And this is also in the, the management, um, in the on-farm research guide. And these are just some little tips that you wanna keep it really simple. You wanna compare just A versus B. Like we went through with Mike, you really have to assess your resources and keep your research in line with what you have. The more time that you spend planning, listing your goals, your objectives, your research question, and then sketching out your design and preparing your field data sheets, all that stuff can be done at the kitchen table. It can be done right now if you're not calving. And um, that will make it so much easier when it comes time to implement it. Um, test your equipment. This is all kind of like just make sure you have everything lined up so that um, it, when you're ready to go, you're really ready to go. It's important that you never lose sight of your goals. Unexpected things happen in research and you wanna be able to make changes on the fly if you have to. Um, stay consistent, treat all experiments the same, avoid your personal bias. Don't walk that hoop over to the big bushy section in the field and place it down there because you really want to capture that alfalfa. It looks so awesome. Throw the hoop wherever it lands is where it lands. You've already carved out the trees. You already said you're not going to sample in the trees. If you had a wet, a wet depression area, you'd carve that out and say, I'm not going to sample here because I know I'm going to get really wonky results. Um, remain objective. Sometimes your results aren't what you hoped they'd be, 
but you can always learn something from that. When you're out in the field, take notes, record your observations. Sometimes your observations lead to really powerful insights into your results. Sometimes you get unexpected results, completely unexpected. You can't believe it. Um, <coughs> that might just be the stepping stone to a new research project. And then repeat it as many times as you can. The more times that you repeat your experiment, the more confidence you have in your results. Um, connect your results to your business plan. So when we think about Mike's original goals to in, increase the number of animals, um, you know, if you find that, yeah, sure, the fertilizer increased yields, but it didn't increase yields enough to offset the cost of the fertilizer, then it actually is not meeting your original goal of, um, you know, your, if your original goal is to make money. Um, yes, you got more yields, but it costs you more in fertilizer than those yields are worth. So there's a whole bunch of stuff available here. Um, this is my webpage, agrowest.ca. So we have here, we have the original research manual. We have a bunch of case studies. We have the templates that uh, we developed um, these last couple of years out in the Kootenays and case studies that go with those. So you can, you can go online and look at all the different resources that are available. But I think now um, would be the time if there's people that have project ideas that they want to talk about, we have time to go through that. And hopefully this presentation and Mike's going through his presentation has got you thinking about what you might like to do. <clears throat> And um, while people get their questions ready, or maybe Patricia wants to, you know, hash out her research idea. What I found interesting, just as someone who has been looking in from the outside, watching Mike and Catherine talk about their project, is when Mike first introduced this idea, he, he was interested not just in alfalfa response to fertilizer, he was also interested in soil health goals. It was very holistic. It was like, I want to improve the soil health of my pasture. I want to increase yields. I want to increase stocking density. Um, and it was only through conversation and thoughtful processes that we're like, okay, well, these could all be spin-offs, but what, what can we measure in one season? And, you know, measuring soil health, for example, from one season would have been a harder sort of measurable, but we were able to whittle it down to like, well, let's start with measuring yield see how that goes. And maybe over time, we can add some soil health indicators. So I thought that was an interesting start to Mike's research project. Patricia, do you want to chat about your project at all? Yeah, I um, hadn't really Put my thoughts in order at all so that really helped got lots of notes on what i could do and how to do it uh my problem is i always want to do too much and i wasn't really thinking what could i measure in one season i'm thinking what can i do in 20 years and mm -hmm. then it become like this huge project so by narrowing it down to one season i can get started easier i think um, but yeah, I'm really interested in the water infiltration because of the fact that I want to get ready for climate change. I feel that I'm going to be short of water, that I'm going to have problems with water and my water rights and that. So mm -hmm. I may be dry land cropping. Uh, maybe I'm just being scared for no reason, but it could happen. And my question is, how can you measure soil carbon? Right. So there's, um, you know, there's some really interesting measurements of soil health. Um, soil carbon is one that is um, focused on a lot, but it's not the 
only measurement. And to measure soil carbon, it does have to, your samples do have to go off to a lab. Um, and soil carbon is very patchy in the landscape and takes a long time to build up. So for example, when you said, oh, I'm thinking, what could I do in 20 years? Well, you could, if you're planning on doing a practice, like I'm going to do intensive grazing on this half of the field, and I'm going to do more, you know, low intensity grazing on this half, you could send soil samples off now and commit to that practice for 10 years and take soil samples in 10 years and see how the carbon has changed in that time period. Um, but there's other interesting things you can do. So um, water infiltration is a great measurement of soil health. Um, when water can get into the soil, it means the soil is nice and porous and loose and, and has lots of wormholes and stuff. Um, Tom Pipe could gave a great intro to that um, in the first webinar that you could look at. Um, so water infiltration is a great measurement of overall soil health. The other one is um, that people talk about is to um, put pieces of cotton fabric in the ground. People talk about using underwear. Doesn't have to be underwear. It's just underwear is fun. But you can put, you know, all you you know, um, identical size pieces of cotton fabric in your treatment versus your untreatment, and then you pull the fabric up after two years, let's say. And the amount of decomposition of that fabric is indicative of the amount of soil microbes that you have. So the, the more it's decomposed, the more biological activity you have in the soil and the more that they are like literally eating that carbon up. And um, so that's another kind of easy, doesn't, you know, it barely costs you anything and, um, and it will show you how much soil biological activity you have. Another one people do is um, they go around between the two treatments and you take, so of course you need 10 pieces of fabric. You would need 10 water infiltration measurements. You could also take a shovel and you could take 10 scoops of soil and count the amount of earthworms in each scoop of soil. So if you have earthworms on your property, then they're also a great indicator of soil health and just the amount of um, kind of like biological activity that's happening in the soil. Um, so those are some really kind of easy, um, non-techy um, measurements that you can make that will give you like legitimate insights into what's happening. So it's not that they're easy and not valuable or useful. They're easy and they are connected to um, science, like what we know is happening in the soil. Um, so those are those are some easy ones that you can do and um, and doesn't involve sending your soil off to a carbon um, for carbon analysis. There's also the, um, oh, what's it called? I, I don't know if it's still active, but there was like kind of a soil health lab. Oh no, now I can't remember the name. Mm, I think it's in, what's that? Is that the one? Soilcc.ca? It's called like CARA or something. And yeah, it, in Alberta. In Alberta. C-A-R-A. Yeah, and they look at measurements of soil health, like the amount of like invertebrates and mm -hmm. other. Yeah, one thing I've been experimenting to, and I see that Shumel has a question too, so we'll get right to that. But one, and this is very preliminary stages, but I've been following the work of the Soil Health Institute, and they've been really happy with this app on your phone actually called Slakes, and it helps measure soil aggregate stability. And I've watched a few webinars actually where they've compared this Slate <coughs> phone app with actual aggregate stability tests in the lab. And it's pretty good what they're finding um, for, for the ease of use. So that's something I haven't even talked with you yet about Catherine, but something that is 
field ready and like an easy, accessible, affordable way to potentially measure aggregate stability, which is another like holistic measure of soil health. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, should we take Shumel's question there? I see his hand is up. I can ask? Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not from Canada. I am from uh, Israel, uh, calling uh, to here. And uh, I want uh, to ask you next question. I want to ask you uh, what uh, are your recommendations uh, in relation to on-farm uh, research uh, in uh, different uh, external uh, areas, uh, external uh, climatic uh, areas, uh, or the uh, deserts, uh, uh, arid, uh, semi-arid uh, areas, uh, like, uh, I know, like a uh, uh, negative uh, uh, desert in Israel or, uh, or desert of uh, Saudi Arabia, Sahara, and uh, uh, other uh, like uh, areas. Yeah. So you're actually, are you joining us from Israel right now? Is that where you yeah, are? I, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah that's nifty. Thank you. Um, so you might be surprised to know that where I am in Kamloops in British Columbia is a semi-arid uh, desert and it's incredibly dry. Um, and I have traveled to Syria and been out in the desert regions of Syria. So I know the challenges that you're talking about. I mean, I, I, a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, I understand how dry you're um, talking about. And for on-farm research, the thing that's so critical is that the producer develops the need and the producer is the one that understands, and by producer, I mean farmer, is the one that understands what, what the challenges are for them on their farm, what, the, what they see the resources are that are available. If they don't have irrigation, um, then you know, that becomes a huge challenge. So this concept of on-farm research it can be taken anywhere in the world because it's the farmer who leads the project, like develops it, even if they have support, um, say from a local scientist or a local government person, um, they're the ones that, the farmer is the one that's saying, look, here's what I need, here are my challenges, um, here's the amount of land that, I can risk to try growing this new crop. So um, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I know you're in Israel and it's very different from Canada, but the challenges of being a farmer probably aren't that different. We have many probably of the same challenges with water and soil fertility and erosion and soil compaction and overgrazing. Um, we also have challenges out in our, um, in our grasslands of, of um, our grasslands being converted from perennial bunch grass ecosystems to annual grasses that once, you know, once the annual grass is done, we're left with just dust. So um, yeah, so it's it really is um, a universal. You can you could use these anywhere. Um, does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Patricia, did you want to add anything?
Well, Catherine, I think this has been um, really fantastic to walk step by step through everything. I see Patricia's unmuted. Sorry, if you, I stepped on your toes there, Patricia. No, that's all right. I don't really have anything really important to add. Just, uh, yeah, that's lots of good ideas. I think I could do all of those in my little research thing. And I will do get my soil tested too for carbon because it's not something I have to do every year. It's something I could do every five years. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be worth it. I just wish I had done it five years ago before I started my restorative agriculture stuff. But I think I better do it this year before I get started on, on more. Yeah. So it's been great. Yeah, thank yeah. you for all. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I just want to say, so this kind of comes back to what Rachel was saying is um, if, if you're going to take your whole farm and implement restorative agriculture, just leave one little patch where you didn't do it, right? One section of a field doesn't have to be very big. It could be just like 20 feet by 20 feet that you fence off and you say, if I never implemented these practices that I'm doing now, if I just kept doing what I've always been doing in five years, what's the change? How have my practices changed the soil, carbon, the soil health? But if you don't section off a little piece of a field to say, this is is how things would be if I hadn't ever done regenerative agriculture, you won't know the impact of your practices. Yeah, it's too bad. I've already kind of 20 years in almost now from, from the way the family ran it before. So I can mm -hmm. see the difference visually. I can really see a difference, but mm -hmm. I'd like to have um, more science behind it, I guess, or farmer science anyways. But it's just really interesting to me to, you know, my goal is just to improve the piece of land I live on and that's about it for my goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, I guess we're at time, aren't we, Rachel? We are. Can I just yeah, sorry, go ahead, really, Harmony. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add something quickly. Um, Catherine, you mentioned that all of these resources are available on um, the AgroWest Web page. Um, I wanted to also say that they are all available on the Climate and Agriculture Initiative website as well. Um, and just for people that maybe haven't visited our website, so as I said, we um, work on agricultural adaptation projects around the province. But if you just Google Climate and Agriculture Initiative, it'll take you to our website. Um, so you can find all the resources, but also if you're still in the um, I guess kind of research phase of your project and trying to understand what you might want to measure and um, you know what you might want to look like. Let's say you're looking at like forage yields and irrigation or integrated cropping systems or whatever it may be. Um, there is lots of, um, there are many, many resources on our website kind of 10 years worth of adaptation research in the province. So um, not only will you find the on-farm research templates but also perhaps some other um, resources that might help you kind of figure out what you want to measure and not just printed resources there's videos and webinars and all of that so um, just google climate and agriculture initiative and you will find it thanks, thanks harmony thank you harmony yeah um i also just uh i really want to thank Catherine for her time she she lives in the Kamloops area but she's been working with producers in the Kootenai and boundary for the last couple of years and we've really appreciated her insights into on-farm research and Mike, thank you for being our guinea pig today and for presenting us with a research idea that you've been thinking about for the last couple of years. And um, did you have any last words you'd like to share about starting off on your research endeavors? Oh, you're muted. Uh, I, I would, Patricia, thanks. And uh, I'm really grateful for uh, Catherine Tarasoff's uh, help. Dr. Tarasoff is, uh, is uh, an amazing resource that we have um, uh, the pleasure of, of uh, having her expertise and availability. Um, research is something, uh, agricultural research is something that has been diminished uh, for decades now. And the extension of that research 
uh, that, that was done prior to that has been diminished. And so in many ways we're on our own. So what Catherine has brought to us is, is very, very helpful because I think that uh, we can't wait forever. If we're going to learn some things about our resources, uh, we may have to um, be a little bit more eager to take some things into our own hands. And this is one way to do that. So I'm really pleased that uh, we've had an opportunity to do this. I just add one little thing in addition is that small things matter. So if you can reduce your costs, if you can increase your productivity, even by very small amounts, or if you can increase your soil health, even by very, very small amounts, uh, over time it adds up and it adds up to big, big things. So I've seen that happen many, many times. If you can, if you can change uh, practices that are quite small over time, you can make big, big differences. So I think that's kind of a mantra that we have to keep in mind. Thank you very much, Mike. And it was Mike who, uh, who warned us that fertilizer prices are going way up this year. So every penny matters every application matters and the more that producers are in charge of their decision making and informed decision making then as Mike said yeah it, it, it matters in the long term and we want to keep keep farmers farming that's our primary goal <laughs> so thank you Mike for sharing your experiences today thank you Dr. Catherine Tarasov thanks for joining us today Harmony as well and for all the producers who joined in today and, and from all across the world and Danny, our team technical support over in the East Kootenai. So without further ado, I'll sign off and we'll send this recording out um, probably early next week. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks Rachel.